All right. Good evening. Is everyone doing? Good. Let's open in prayer and we'll get started. Well, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, as always, for being a perfect, glorious God. We thank you for creating us in your own image, Lord God. We continue to marvel at what that means and probably don't, we'll never under, fully understand um, all that you've done to uh, bless us with your image, Lord God, but I pray that we would be good image bearers of you in all the days of our life when we call upon your name, Lord God, that we would represent you well in your kingdom, that we would uh, speak truth, Lord God, in love just as you've called us to do, that we would grow closer to you, Lord God, through prayer, through fellowship and discipleship, as well as through the study of your word. I just pray that tonight would be um, a blessing to each one of us, Lord God, and that we would grow closer to you through our understanding of how you have arranged the universe, Lord God, for man's presence to be here on this earth. We just thank you for your blessings, your grace, and ask for your spirit to fill us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, a few things to get, be, to make sure we communicate before we get started, so welcome in, everybody. Um, first part is, uh, this is the last, or the second to last Tuesday before the end of October, so that means that la the last Tuesday of October happens to be October 31st, when we as a church dedicate everything that we do in the evening to uh, Trunk or Treat, trying to bless our community with um, some gospel tracks and some op uh, alternative opportunities for people to do something other than um, the traditional secular side of things. It's a little bit of a bridge, but we want to build a bridge to our community um, with how we treat that particular day. So you're welcome to come, you're welcome to volunteer and serve, but we will not have class next Tuesday just to make sure we're 100% clear and on the same page with that. Um, and then secondarily, I need to just uh, uh, open up and uh, uh, offer a true apology to everybody for last week. Um, it has nothing to do with what happened at the end of class. It has to do with the fact that I, um, I did not handle the Word of God appropriately as effectively as I should. If you haven't already figured it out or we're sitting there scratching your head, um, it, was, it has to do with the blessing uh, that God said. Be, he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Um, and I've, I've taught Genesis so many different times, but this has been a brand new teaching, new, new uh, topic, or I'm sorry, new notes and all of that. And I don't know, I thought I had actually went through and verified and did a word search in my Bible software and all that kind of stuff. If you didn't recognize it already, day five, he blessed the animals and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And even in my notes, this wasn't just a slip of the tongue. I actually said, oh, the first blessing came on day six when he blessed mankind. Um, I whatever, thought I was doing it right, thought I had followed procedures that keep me safe from all that kind of stuff, but I mishandled God's word, and that always really bums me out um, to have misstated it um, in a teaching environment like that. So thank you. Apologize for that. Uh, scratch out your notes if there's anything that uh, is confusing on that area. God certainly did bless mankind on day six. Um, it does indicate, you know, that God was truly blessing them and instructing them to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth as he had done. Uh, but he said that to the animals too. And so that's where I made my mistake. Um, and like I said, I've taught it before, never made that mistake before. So how it's creeped into my thinking this time around, I don't even actually know. Busy, I, I give you a thousand excuses. Literally all I want to do is apologize for any kind of misleading or misteaching on that that would have come from that. So... With that, let's move on. We had a couple of slides left over because we ended a couple minutes early last week, and we actually looked like we were probably going to make it until I went dizzy for some reason. So um, anyway, let's finish off that couple of sections of notes from last, last week on uh, day six, part two, and then we'll uh, move into the second chapter of Genesis. So this is just really, I think, picking up exactly where we left off when I uh, had to close out. So um, the incredible work that God, uh, that God, of God to create everything in, at day six had reached its zenith, right? That was his plan. That was his intention. He got to day six and said, here, I'm going to make man in my own image, male and female. I will create them. And that is why everything that I have done to this point has existed or has been done um, was to create man. There was never, I don't think you can ever make a claim that God didn't intend for man to be the primary function or purpose why he created. Does he love diversity? Yes, we see that in the animal kingdom, in the plant kingdom, in the stars in the heaven. But God intended to create man, a, a, a being that would bear his own image 
And then as we talked about last week, he was going to hand the keys over and say, this is now the kingdom, the world, the universe that I'm going to ask you as man to take dominion over, not as God, but as God's image-bearing representatives to the world. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to show all of creation, the invisible God, through a visible, tangible, and material human being, or set, or you know, pair of human beings leading to a whole population of human beings. So the, then what we see here as we close out day six is that the God who created everything then reserved the right to declare that what he had made to be now very good. Right? So in six days, he says the word good seven times. Six times, one each for each of the days, but then at the conclusion of all things, but before day seven, he says he saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. There's so many ways you can translate that phrase, very good. It can be perfectly ordered, perfectly suited for my purposes and the intention for which I created it. Um, it can also say, it lacks nothing. God looked at this and said, there was not a single thing that needed to be done for his perfection to be experienced on this planet and actually throughout the entire universe. And because it was perfect, and because it was very good and lacked nothing, from this very moment, at the end of day six, God would never again need to add a single atom or to form any new living creatures from the world in order for it to continue indefinitely in, and in the state of absolute perfection. It lacked nothing. The, the plants had seeds to feed all of the animals, and they could eat them, and the, and the seeds would regrow, and new fruits, new, new herbs, all of the things that were necessary for life. Mankind could continue to produce and multiply and fill the earth. There was never going to be a shortage of resources, land or fruits and vegetables and, and seeds with which to be consumed. It was absolutely perfect. God didn't need to add anything. Now we can talk about all the impacts of the fall when we get another chapter forward into chapter three, but God looked at it and said, I'm done. I don't need to add anything to creation. So, uh, it, and he makes it specifically quite clear that you know, that, um, that he had worked, again, he's, he's summarizing the week. He worked for six days, it was good, and when God finished in his, his work on the sixth day, it was, of course, very good. Now, why did he do it? That's, that's a big question. You know, it used to be, some theologians would argue, well, why didn't God just do it in a, in a microsecond, or at least at a maximum of one day? Well, he did it because he wanted to establish a pattern for the man that he created to rule over the earth and to have dominion over it. And so this perfect pattern that God created, even in pre-fall days, included Adam and Eve, and we'll talk about that in this a little bit. Well, we actually won't get much to it tonight uh, if we go where we're going. But in, in the weeks that follow, we'll talk about how man is created for work. And when I, of course, say man, I mean everybody. We're all created to work. But even in paradise... Even in perfection, even when perhaps Adam was not doing labor by the sweat of his brow and dealing with thorns and thistles and all the stuff that happened at the curse, he was intended to work for six days and to rest on the seventh day. Right? So that is not a fall, a post-fall or condition of a fallen world. That is what God intended, that man would follow the exact pattern that God followed, work for six take a rest. Work for six and take a rest. That's why God did all of the six weeks of creation exactly the way he did it. So the pattern and the picture that we should envision with this creation is that it should put, put to rest any notion that heaven will be a perpetual place of rest, right? Sleeping on clouds and playing harps is kind of that, you know, misunderstanding that the world kind of has, and they think Christians, all we want to do is sleep on clouds and play harps, right? No, God has, you know, he's going to, what does Christ say when he's giving out the talents or whatever, you know? You've been faithful over a little, I'll give you now, go rule over 10, you know, kingdoms or 10 cities or whatever it is. He's got things for us to do, even in eternity. And this class won't be, or this study through Genesis won't be much on heaven, 
But just think about it, that it is absolutely God's intention in the perfect state of paradise that man would work for six and he would rest on a day. Um, and, and we should expect that as believers. If we're walking into eternity with God, we should expect that we'll have work to do in heaven and we will have days that are dedicated by God as Sabbath rests days. Okay. So what can be discovered about uh, God in the six days of creation? What we've looked at in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 31. Okay. Well, we can see that God is eternal, right? Because in the beginning, God. It wasn't in the beginning God became something. It's in the beginning God. He's always been. And it wasn't God uh, was in the beginning. It was in the beginning of our timeline of earth's history, of the universe itself. God was there, and then he spoke it into existence. So we see, we can theologically conclude just from the text that God is eternal. Because he is, and he created. And it should also be uh, clear that he's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He can do what his desires are of his mind, his will, and his heart. Of course, we know there's certain things God can't do, like he cannot lie. He can't deny himself. These are things that are spoken of in Scripture. But God can create what he envisions to create. Kind of mentioned that before. You know, you know what would man have to do? You know, we would, if we wanted to invent a giraffe, we'd have to go into the laboratory and we'd have to invent how to make a giraffe work, how, it, how it's not, its head isn't going to explode when it bends down to take a drink out of the river, because it would if it wasn't designed not to. I don't have my notes on giraffes at the moment, but uh, I'll give you a second. Is They have a spongy kind of substance in their skull, and it can fill with blood without exploding, so that when it actually does bend down to take a drink, there's many... Uh, differential changes in the pressure of the blood. Imagine how much pressure it takes to get up 14 feet or whatever the height of a giraffe's head is. That takes a lot of blood pressure to pump it up. Now you put it down and that blood pressure doesn't need to be there anymore, the head will explode. Except it doesn't because God designed it not to. We would have to go in the lab and figure it out, and we still can't figure it out. We can't create anything like a giraffe, right? But, God, but does God have to go into a laboratory and make a giraffe a few, different, a few thousand different ways, like Edison made a light bulb a thousand different you know, iterations until he got it right? No. God says, make a giraffe, and there's a giraffe, or any other creature that we could look at that's absolutely marvelous and amazing. He's all-powerful, and he's also all-knowing. He knows how to create giraffes and lions and bears and tigers and human beings exactly as he intended them to be, with, with never a statement that goes, yeah, I'd do it differently next time. Never, uh, I almost got that one right. No, he's all-knowing. He knows everything. We can begin to see this in the story, in the account of the six days of creation. We can also say God is transcendent, and if I need that, I'll just you know, define the word. That just means he transcends the physical universe that we live in. He's not contained in the universe. He transcends it. Yes, he can interact with it, but he's not part of it. He created it. So he transcends the universe. Obviously, God is creative. So uh, we can, he's put creativity in us. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, beavers don't build dams. That seems pretty creative. But he put creativity in us, but that shows that God himself is very crea a creative being. He, he did, didn't just say, well, I'd like to have an image bearer I can't think of anything else to make, so I'll just make image bearers. He made the entire world, stars upon stars upon stars out there in the galaxies and across the universe, and he made all kinds of variety of life. And we'll, so we'll talk about after the fall, I find it interesting that he, like, let's say he took a, a, a tiger. We look at that today and say it's a carnivorous it's, some people call it an, um, an obligate carnivore. It can only eat meat. But that wasn't the way it was in the beginning, and, and we'll, as we'll see in the coming chapter. And that is that uh, God created it to eat, let's say, f vegetables and fruits in the pre-fall condition, but then had all of the variability it needed to survive in a post-fall and post-flood world when things are eating other things. And it needs to eat things in order to survive. God created all of that variability within the created kinds from the very beginning. We can also see 
obviously, God is not some Star Wars type force, you know, uh, you know, that you might be able to use for good and you might be able to use for evil. No, he has a will. He has purpose in everything that he does. We're not here by accident, mankind or any other created kind. We're all here because God intended for us to be here okay? um, as a species and as a planet and as a universe. We also see from, and this is really should be a clear message from the six days of creation, God prefers order over chaos, right? He prefers order, not chaos, order. And so he, he, he didn't just say, look, I created this perfect universe. You have no idea what disorder is. He started off and said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void and darkness is on the face of the deep. Do you get a picture of what, what disorganization looks like, what disorder looks like. He says, okay, well, I'm going to take it from that stage to another stage, to another stage, to another stage, until it's fully unified in its order. He prefers order over chaos. So we should, as image bearers of God, prefer order, order over chaos. That's why he created families. That's why he created government. That's why he created all of these institutions so that there is actually order and not chaos in his creation. God prefers, uh, or God does not cease until he accomplishes his will, right? Notice that he didn't take a break on day three and then go back to creating. He, he, he did not cease until his will was accomplished. What does that tell us about our salvation? Right? God does not cease until he accomplishes his will. He wants, every, he desires that everyone would be saved. And so he's not ceasing to fulfill a plan of redemption that began in the garden 6,000 years ago and has been through the cross 2,000 years ago and is still op in operation today as God is long-suffering, patient, not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to repentance. He wants all to come to the knowledge of him, even knowing that most even won't. But he still has a will, and he's accomplishing that will because he's going to go out and find the one sheep that is lost out of the 99, and that sheep might be somebody still not yet born, why he's still patiently waiting. But we also know from an eschatology perspective, he won't wait forever, and so he does, he will accomplish that will too, which is to restore the universe and the, and the earth back to what he wants it to be. And maybe even better this time. Not that it was bad last time, but it's got more, it has more going for it in the sense of millions upon millions of redeemed people that he's going to use for those purposes. All right, and then God, uh, we also see that God is the only one who truly has the right to define what is good and what is right, okay? He said, let there be light, and he saw that there was light, and it was good. He understands and knows what is good and right. He didn't delegate that to man, did he? He delegated dominion over the earth. He didn't say, now you decide what's right and wrong for yourselves, Never once do you see that kind of phrase in Scripture. He, God, decides he has the exclusive right, truly, to define what is good and what is right and what is wrong and what is unjust, let's say. God defines and creates things like beauty. We talked about that with the golden ratio and all of that. We see beauty in everything, and mankind copies from creation all the time. Because we understand that what we see in creation is beautiful, so let's copy it for ourselves. So we see that God defines what is beautiful. And, and you know, isn't it interesting? We, sometimes I think we put this um, sterilized version of God in our minds and go, well, God thinks everybody's beautiful. Well, yeah, I think he believes everybody's beautiful in the heart, but doesn't he say, like, Saul was the best looking of all of the people of Israel, and David was a ruddy man and really good looking, and we see these, these not, not from man to man, like uh, uh, Jacob looking at Rachel and thinking she's absolutely beautiful. We're talking about God making a declaration that certain people are actually more beautiful than others. That's because he's creative, and he's created people to have a range of beauty within all of these things, right? It's not that God doesn't value every single person on the planet, but each one of us has a different gifting. In the same way, some of us have gifting for 
you know, being generous, and some of us have a gifting for prayer, and some of us have a gifting for um, intercession, and, and some of us have a, a inter, you know, administration, gifts of administration, those kind of things. God gives people different things, and that includes things like beauty. And you might say, well, gosh, I sure think um, a, a giraffe is more beautiful than a slug that crawls on the sidewalk or the window, right? Well, God has different designs. Does that mean the slug doesn't have a purpose in God's kingdom? No, I think it does. But, you know, whatever, a giraffe or a peacock or a, you know, whatever, might be, in our eyes, more beautiful than, than something else. God is one who defines these things. We, so we shouldn't be ashamed to look at God's creation and say, I see beauty there. Now, we can always pervert that and be silly about it and, and sinful about it, but we can look at God's creation and say, I see beauty here. And what is amazing is we can still see beauty even in a fallen world. It's got to be way more beautiful to the eyes and to the heart when it's unfallen in Adam's day and in the day that's yet to come for us. We can also see that God knows the future and prepares all things for future events, right? He knew he wanted to make man on day six. So as he progressed through day one, two, three, four, and five, it was all being set up for his plans on day six. He knows the future, and he knows how to accomplish all things to accomplish the future that he has um, seen and desired to come about. Okay, well, I'll give you a second. That ends those notes. If anybody has any thoughts or questions, I can work through those. But. Do we have dominion over the universe? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, we have dominion over what we would have the capacity to have dominion over. Okay. And we can talk about the fall and how we really transferred dominion to Satan uh, unwittingly, right? But, um, but yeah, I, I think there's this very strong possibility. I can't 100% back it up. But when we get into eternity, we might be, we might, some of us might take journeys off to Alpha Centauri and to do something over there that God wants us to have action in, right? We might be, we might be space travelers in, in the future, in heaven. I don't know. It doesn't say we are. It doesn't say we're not. But he created all this great big stuff out there. And I think a lot of people wonder and speculate, okay, so when we get to perfection, when we get to eternity, do we remain just here? Or is there going to be more things that God will um, have us go to? No promises. Don't, I'm not trying to be a heretic or anything. I'm just saying it's within the realm of possibilities that we might be the, the people who rule over more than a territory here on this planet. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I, I see the point. I, I'm, you know, it's all up to, um, you know, hypothesis and speculation. So, the, you know, for those online or who couldn't hear it, you know, because there's no, no night in the eternal state, we wouldn't be able to see stars in the sky and, and the, maybe even the moon or something like that. Um, and so maybe we don't go anywhere beyond this earth. That is a very valid interpretation. We just don't know. But I'm saying, you know, it, it, we don't, there's, I, what I can say is I don't believe there's any other image bearers out there in the 93 billion trillion miles or whatever of the universe who is in control of some other part of the universe, right? God created, and then he transferred dominion, authority, over to man, over what he created. And he did create the sun, moon, and the stars. And so whether we have dominion over them from the earth or there is any possibility that there's something that happens outside, beyond the earth, I don't know, but I wouldn't rule it out, I guess is how I would look at it. Okay, so let's transition now into the book of Genesis chapter 2. We'll, we'll look at the first seven verses. So you want to get the notes out for tonight. They were in the back. All right, let me... Uh, let me read through Genesis 1 through, or 2, 1 through 7. So, thus the heavens and the earth, so this is a conclusion after chapter 1, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. 
and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he, in it he rested from all of his work which he had done, or which he had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and the earth. When they were created, in the day that the Lord, Yahweh, God, made the earth and the heavens. And the Yahweh, God, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So we're going to transition in here to chapter 2. Go ahead and just set it up. Remember, lots of uh, skeptics will say there's a conflict or, you know, between chapters 1 and chapter 2 in terms of they're telling different stories, giving different accounts or whatever. We'll cover that a little bit more probably in two weeks when we come back together. Um, but, you know, just, just know we're kind of entering into something new after day 7 is starting to be described for us to, to envision and understand in a world that we've never actually had an opportunity to, to visit. Okay, so let's walk through at least the first part of th those first seven verses. Cre uh, once again, we see creation is declared to be complete. It lacks nothing. So uh, the chapter, chapter one ends, and I was, we are looking at the end of chapter one here, and, chap and chap chapter two, verse one, if I can spit that out. Chapter, the chapter ends, or chapter 1 opens, with the same declaration that was made in Genesis 1-1 concerning the heavens and the earth, right? But this time, they weren't just created with the potential to be more, but they're actually finished, right? So, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and we get to here, and all that God had made was finished, so he, but he did make the heavens and the earth. He made it, and now they're complete, so we see that they're finished. So one final aspect of creation is, n is noted here just as we transition from chapter two or chapter one to chapter two. And it says that all the host of heaven were finished. That is a direct, re re uh, direct reference here to angels. Okay? Uh, and I will give you a little bit of a, a proof of that here. So uh, in Job 38, speaking to Job about his little science quiz, God asked Job, you know, to what were the foundations of the earth fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? Important point here. When the morning stars sang together, I don't think we're talking about actual cloud giant, gas giants in the stars, right? We're talking about the angels here. Because then it says, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, right? So they were there present when... Uh, they saw the foundations of the earth being fastened, right? Or, the, you know, God creating the foundations of the earth. So there seems to be some indication here uh, that the sons of God, which we would also call angels, or maybe even the host of heaven, are, uh, were likely present really from the first day of creation. Now, we should never confuse that they were somehow um, eternal, like God is eternal. No, they live in eternity, but it's very clear that they, were, they are and have always been created beings. And since God created from day one to day six, it then becomes a, a speculation or question, when were the host of heaven created? It says they were created by the time you get to day seven, or the end of day six, but it actually doesn't say when they were created. But the, the timing of the sequence of, of the creation of angels is often a question on people's mind, right? But remember, this is an invisible world, and we probably will never be able to determine that with greater specificity, okay? Um, it's clear, as I said, from Genesis 2-1 that the host of heaven, the angels, and whatever other category of spiritual beings that you want to put in there, cherubim, seraphim, all of the different kinds of things, whether you put them all in one category or you multiply them out into different categories, that's a different topic. But all the host of heaven all the spiritual beings that were created were created by on or before day six because God ceased on day seven. So he had to have been on day one through six. Since angels were not mentioned in chapter one of Genesis, probably, and the reason why is probably because the focus is on the physical world, the kind of world that man understands and interacts with far more than the spiritual world, at least at the onset. Okay? 
So it was all about how God created a physical world for man to inhabit and to dwell upon and ultimately to take dominion over. So it never entered the conversation as to when angels were being created. But God does finish the, the conclusion of all things just so people don't ever confuse that angels are eternal. He says, and the ho- all the host of heaven were created, um, you know, were finished in the creative, creative process there by day six. So for us, for beings who exist outside of a temporal understanding, I mean, you know, a world that we can tangibly see, uh, under, uh, the understanding of time in the physical universe, there's really in maybe no way in human language to communicate timing of spiritual beings who are not subject to the constraints of time, which is a physical property, as proven by Einstein. How do you say a, time, a being who inhabits timelessness, well, they were created on, in some specific point in time, right? You see there's, a, there's kind of a theological or, or logical dilemma there. You got timeless beings. No, they're not eternal, but they're timeless. They don't experience the passage of time the way a man or a woman or a person on the planet or even an animal experiences the passage of time. So it doesn't make any sense really to try and pinpoint, oh, the angels are created on day four. If there's not really a day four because there wasn't a evening and a morning in their environment where they were living or where they were created to live. Does that make any sense at all? Right? They're timeless beings in the sense that they, don't ha- they do have a beginning, but they don't experience the passage of time except as they view earth passing time and watch what happens uh, on the earth as time passes for them or for us, and they can observe that passage. So I would say theologically, it's really of little, very little importance uh, where within the 144 hours of the creation week, angels were created. What is important to understand is that they are created beings, certainly not eternally existing, and they're certainly not equivalent to God or some lower form of a God. They're created beings, and we even find that reference um, in Hebrews chapter 1, um, and quoting, I think, uh, one of the Psalms. I can't remember which one at the moment. Okay. All right, so then, now we've got all, everything that we know. The, the invisible world of spiritual beings, yes, God created them sometime between day one and day six. And by the, by day, the end of day six, everything that God intended to create and would ever create for this perfect world had been created, and then he ceased and the angels were there with him. And we saw from Job 38 that they were singing and, and praising God for founding the earth and all that he was doing here on this planet. So then we see in, in verses 2 through 3 of chapter 2, the establishment, establishment of the Sabbath rest. So the seventh day was obviously, in a, everything God does is with a will and a purpose, He clearly intended the six days of creation to be completed with a day of rest, the seventh day. Um, And that was, he established that for us. Okay, and then Jesus himself, of course, specifically says, the Sabbath, a man was not made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. When God established it here in Genesis chapter 2, it was so that man would have a day out of six, or a day, one day out of seven, to rest. Of course, God was not tired he wasn't in need of rest. This has nothing to do with God in the sense of his need for rest and relaxation and replenishment. All he was doing was establishing a pattern for man to follow forevermore afterward. Okay. So Genesis 2, 1 through 3 is the basis on which, if you haven't figured it out, the basis upon which the world actually observes a seven-day work week or a seven-day week. Okay. Um, and we can find that out because, see, years are defined by, we know, the time it takes the earth to orbit the sun, right? 365 and a, and a quarter days or whatever it is now, it probably has changed a little bit in the last 6,000 years. But basically, 360 to 365 and a quarter days or, or whatever, um, there is this, okay, so that's a year. We got it. For us today, it's 365 and a quarter. Months are typically tied to the phases of the moon. In fact, there's a linguistic cognate, right? A month. 
a month, a moon, right? We're talking about the passage of time with the observance of moon or lunar cycles, maybe it'd be more accurate to say, lunar cycles, and so they were originally tied. Now, that's like 29 and a half days or whatever, so again, things might be a little out of sync with the part that we live in a fallen world, but years, Earth orbiting the sun, the months, the concept of months, lunar cycles, as the, as the moon goes through phases each on a regular repeating pattern, basically once a month. Where does a seven-day week come from? It doesn't have anything to do with cosmology. It doesn't have to do with the, what happens in the sky, stars of the sky. The past, I remember on day four, he said, look, I gave them the stars, the sun, the moon, the stars for times and seasons and all the understanding of how things pass. Well, where do you get a seven-day week out of any of that? You don't. Mathematically, it sucks, doesn't it? Seven doesn't go into anything very easily, right? So you got these 360-day years or 365-day years, and you got these 30-day or 29-and-a-half-day months. None of this is divisible by seven, right? Where does seven come from? Why does the world still committed to a seven-day week? Because of Genesis chapter 1. That's where we got the ability and the understanding of measuring a, our sh more shorter cycles are, more, are, you know, between a day and a month is a week, and we get it from Genesis chapter 1. There is no, uh, no other logical reason why we ever, the world would observe a seven-day week. It all comes from Genesis 1. And the reason we see that is because God instituted a Sabbath day, right? a day of rest. And I believe the Sabbath day that we're being introduced to here and is then referenced, obviously, in the law with the giving of the Torah or at Mount Sinai, all the way through the Old Testament, even into the New Testament, and even into the Millennial Kingdom and beyond, we will see this concept of a Sabbath rest. And I believe it has four fundamental purposes that man should understand and observe even for us today. And so uh, this is why it's, this is pre-fall again. No, uh, this is pre-fall, pre-flood, and pre-law. When we talk about the Sabbath, it has nothing to do with Moses in the sense of it being established at Sinai. It has to do with being established in Genesis, which Moses wrote. But he, he was long since <laughs> a, a sparkle in somebody's eye before that was ever came to be. All right, so I believe point number one, it is used, the Sabbath is used to remind all of creation that God is the creator. One day in seven, we should be kind of reminded or strongly reminded that we're here because God is a creative God. We're here because 6,000 years ago, God took six days to create the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. We should be honoring that. We should be worshiping for that. We should be celebrating that God created. I think that's a very important part of this seventh day's of rest. Why seven? Why do we rest on the seventh day? Mama, Papa, Grandma, Grandma, whatever. Because God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. So we honor him by resting also. Okay, I think that's point number one. It is used to set aside a day of rest for man to observe. God created man, and he has perfect understanding of how important it is for man to observe a day of rest. Again, pre-fall, pre-flood, pre-law, everything else, God says it's a good for man to have a day of rest. Um, and there's really not a lot, well, while the Sabbath laws that came to Moses have a lot of things, that, it says a lot of things about what man can't do on the Sabbath. And then that was obviously added to in abundance by the Pharisees and lawyers and whatnot by Jesus' day. There's actually not very much said about what you're supposed to do on the Sabbath. It's a day of rest. Well, okay, we're well, supposed to rest. But some people turn it into a very deeply, you know, spiritual, religious, studious, whatever kind of thing. But God, I, I, the main command is to rest. Right, to make it a day of rest. You know, if we can certainly, I think we should honor God, the God of creation, but we, we really should be, God told me to rest, I should rest as part of this. Okay. So, he knows us better than we know us. Seems like we probably do injustice to our health, psychological health, physical health, and probably spiritual health 
by not taking a day of rest without being legalistic about it and without being dogmatic about it, but just making sure that we are not all go and no rest in our life. This weekly rest also reminds man to observe a day to, commu- I think it is to commune with God, right? And to be thankful what he has done, not just for creation, but I think creation is a big part of it, but to be thankful, take a day to be thankful. Take, take, take a day to remember all that God has done in blessing us, not just as a people group, as humanity, but individually. Take a day to be commune with our God. Um, again, but I don't think there's a formula that has been given to us that we have to follow. This is, these are just observations. Okay? And I think finally, though, the Sabbath rest uh, serves as a promise to man that after he has worked throughout this entire life, that God will give him a eternal rest. Right? Man will work, like our life that we live from, from cradle to grave is like six days of work, and God gives us a seventh day of eternal rest to expect, to have a hope in. Right? That's a lot of what the book of Hebrews is about when we were going through that on Sunday morning. It's about the seventh day of rest, looking forward to the promised rest. So there's four things we can contemplate about why does God give us the Sabbath, and what should we think about observing on our, on our own Sabbath, whether that's on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Tuesday, or any other day, right, sh- what we should do. Let's regularly remember and honor the God who created in six days. Let's remember he created us and knows us better than we know ourselves, so let's take some time to rest out of our busy schedules. Let's have, make sure that we have regular, intentional fellowship with God, even when the busyness of life is kind of overwhelming us, take some time to commune with God and never, ever forget that the real reason any of us are here and the reason anything that has to do with our relationship to God has any purpose at all is because Jesus went to the cross and purchased eternal rest for us by his blood, and that's the promise, that's the hope that we are always to be looking forward to. So take one day in seven, whatever way you want to look at it, and make sure that those, maybe one or more, or maybe all four of those, are part of your thinking and your heart towards God on that day. So it was clearly that God intended to bless man. It wasn't supposed to be like this, oh, I got to take a Sabbath rest. Oh, you know, I can't go to the store, and I can't, you know, whatever. It wasn't supposed to be this burden, it's supposed to be a blessing, okay? Um, But that blessing that God intended, even for Adam, even before the fall 6,000 years ago, we see that there's corruption, and the first corruption of the Sabbath is by man and maybe by Satan, is was to profane the Sabbath by making it a burden rather than a blessing, right? You, oh, and, and look, Israel today has, and I can only remember some of them, but you know, you have Sabbath elevators. Anybody heard of the Sabbath elevators in Israel? Okay. If you go to Israel, I've never been and I would like to go, but my understanding is certain hotels that want to be observant to the Sabbath regulations believe that pushing the button of an elevator is work and would violate the Sabbath. So they have Sabbath elevators that stop on every floor so that you don't have to push the button. The bigger hotels might have an odd and an even Sabbath elevator so that if you're staying on floor 11, your elevator stops at, at 3, 5, 7, 9, right? And then you get to 11. Um, and, but you know, they also have a Gentile elevator that you can still push the buttons on because Gentiles don't have to observe the Sabbath. Okay? This is how they have made it a burden rather than a blessing because all of these rules and regulations that are just not in the Scripture and are certainly not a blessing to mankind to have to look there, let the elevator open the door, close the door, open the door, close the door. Nothing happens. You're just riding up because this is, you're supposed to be resting. And I know there's a number of other examples of things that they can and, and will not do in observance of the Sabbath. It's not supposed to be a burden. It's supposed to be a blessing. The second corruption is, of course, by apathy. 
and disobedience, to not actually honor the Sabbath so as to receive the blessing, right? So we go one extreme over here. We will, we will not do anything that even remotely seems like work or whatever, including pushing a button on an elevator, to we got no relationship to the Sabbath whatsoever. Let's, let's just blow it off. Every day is the same. There's no reason to t- think about God. There's no reason to think about creation. There's no reason to take a rest because my body can go, 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 go without any rest. Well, I think that's another corruption, another profaning of the Sabbath intention that God gave to man. So swinging the pendulum, that's always the case, isn't it? You either go way too far over here, and you're ridiculous in your attempts to please God with the Sabbath, or you swing it way over here, and God isn't even in your thought process. Right? What we should be doing is a little more or in, in, incredibly balanced in I want, I want to let the blessing that God intends for me to come to me, and I want to participate in that, but I won't make it a burden to my life. Yeah? Well, then you're saying then if you have a work schedule, yeah. and you have to work Sunday, you, and you have to Friday off, mm-hmm. is that a day of rest? It certainly can be, yes. If you have... It, Yeah, I, I, yeah and, and again, I, I don't want to be religious or, or onerous or burdensome. If your work schedule, your school schedule, your whatever, you're in the military, whatever it is, and you say, no, the, the Sabbath rest, whether that's Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, whatever it is, doesn't work, then you, you might say to yourself, God, how would, I, how would you have me to think about structuring my free time so that I have a, can observe something that you want to be a blessing to me for. Right? That's how I would take it. Not, I'm going to rigidly do this. Now, sometimes we have to be rigid because we, otherwise we won't even do anything at all. Right? We kind of have to get into a habit. We have to get into a pattern. But I think God wants the Sabbath to be, look, take time to rest. Make sure it's regular. You know, one day in seven is not that all that much to ask. And then let it be a blessing. If it becomes a burden, if it becomes a religion in and of itself, then God is not really part of it, then what's the point? Right. So we want to be connected to God through some kind of intentional, regular periods of observing the rest. It does not mean that it has to be, again, as soon as we turn it into a burden, we become like a Pharisee. And we have over-regulated that, our life to the point where God says, I didn't make man for the Sabbath. I made the Sabbath for man. All right. So for me, here, let me try to summarize some of this. For New Testament believers, I think the Sabbath should be highly valued for three distinct, the three distinct purposes once again. Praising God, the Creator, which refutes naturalism and you know, evolution and all of those kinds of things. A call to perseverance in our faith so as that we truly know with our hearts that we have a great hope that we will finish, cross the finish line of our race of faith and enter into God's promised rest, just like he says in Hebrews 4.1, 4.9, and throughout really much of the rest of the book of Hebrews. Okay? And we should have, if, we, if it's not built into, you know, if, we, if some of us, if we're retired or we have whatever, we, have, we can do this seven days a week and it's fine, but... If you're not, then making sure we have a regular time to pray, maybe fast, study the word, truly rest in the blessing of the relationship that God has purchased for us on the cross for in Christ. Right? These are things to think about. Please don't hear me say, I just created a new law for believers. I don't think we're not under the law. We're under grace but is there value? Is there benefit? Is there a blessing in taking an observer, uh, observation of what God intended before the fall, before the law, before any of those things happen? He made one day in seven for man to rest. Do we honor that or do we ignore that? Which, how, how should we respond to that? That's really a, a matter of personal conscience. Go read Romans chapter 14. Right, what you know? Every what, if, if it's something, you know, one man honors one day above another, and I'll, I'll, every another man honor, honors every day the same. Whichever way you go, if, as long as you're blessing the Lord and being obedient to what you believe He's calling you to do, you're good. So Romans 14 kind of overrides all of that. So it's not legalism; it's searching for the blessing that God would have for us in how we conduct ourselves.
All right. Um, remember that God blessed and sanctified this day. That seems pretty important. He blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified, set it apart, made it special, made it a holy day, different than the other six days of the week. Okay. So it was blessed because God did this very special thing on that day. He, the God of the universe, rested to show us the importance of rest. Okay. Um, and, you know, and, it's so that, and also for us to recognize that there is an eternal rest that we will see through him. So God himself set this part, again, sanctification, right, or, or sanctified the day, set the day apart from all the other days. It's special. It's unlike the other six days of any given week, and it's especially different from the six days of creation. Notice how different this day is from God said, let there be, and it was, and he said it was good, and all is such a different pattern, isn't it? We saw this intentionally, I think, we saw this pattern in the six days of creation of God working and God declaring that it was good and all that happened there. But on the seventh day, he rested, and he blessed the day, and he sanctified it, having done nothing to say, oh, and he said, let there be, and it was, and it was good. No, just he sanctified it, blessed it. Okay. So it's, it's quite different than the other days um, of creation, and it's intended to impact the way we think and act as human beings in God's creation. Now notice also that there was no evening and morning recorded. You notice that pattern, right? So there was an evening and there was a morning, and it was day one. We'll see that here in a little bit as we summarize. And there was an evening and morning, day two, and so on and so on and so on. Notice here, if you, we go back and read Genesis 2, 1 through 7, it didn't say it was this, God rested on the seventh day, so there was an evening and the morning, and there was day seven. No, it didn't say that. It was, so some commentators, I believe, mistakenly assume that the seventh day never ended. Right? We're still living in God's seventh day. That's, I've heard many preachers and seen commentaries that would make that kind of statement. We're still living in the, the seventh day. I don't think that was the intended meaning of leaving off the evening and the morning, right? I think we have something else going on here. Like because of Exodus 20:11, I might reference that many times as we finish off here. Exodus 20:11 and other there's other places in scripture. It makes it clear that this was really just a normal earth day. It was day 7. God said, "I rested on one day. I, I'm instructing you Moses, tell your people to rest on the 7th day. Take the Sabbath day." So it's like it's a day. Like so many other conversations we've had about creation week, it's a day. But some people say, oh, we're living in the seventh, we're living, still living on day seven. It doesn't really seem to fit with the text of scripture from the way I have uh, interpreted it. I think the theological purpose, there, I think there really is a theological purpose of not having an evening and a morning, okay? And that is this, that the Sabbath that we see here on the day seven of creation is it serves as a model to represent eternal life in heaven, which I've already referenced several times. But picture it as a model now. Don't just picture it as God saying, I want you human beings to rest one day in seven. I think he's saying, in the lifespan of humanity, you're going to live, let's call that six days, and then you're going to get to day seven, and you're going to have an eternal rest, and there's not going to be an evening and a morning because there's no night there right? He's trying to get you to picture the seventh day is really different. The eternal rest that he's promising me is really different. It's not just a better day than the six that I lived on this earth. It's, a, it's entirely different, and yet a blessing sanctified, set apart by God for special purposes. So I think that's why he didn't say, that's my theological conclusion is, he didn't say evening and morning day seven, first off because he wasn't creating, but it doesn't, it's not to indicate there wasn't a actual 24-hour day, it's to indicate this is what eternal life looks like, so I can use this as a theological model throughout the rest of scripture to call you to a Sabbath rest in eternity with Christ. So without a night to replace the day in heaven, there would, uh, there would be, uh, not be a literal evening and morning as humans have understood them in the la for the last 6,000 years, right? So there's, without a night in this heaven to come, 
right? Then there would not be this, we wouldn't experience this evening and morning kind of thing um, and as we're talking about eternity. So I think there's a relationship there. So we're still talking about eternal life. It, it's that promised rest. Hebrews uses that phrase all the time. So I think while there's many functions to perform in heaven, going back to what we talked about a little, bit, uh, a little while ago, there's going to be many functions to ha- occur in heaven. Sometimes we need to cast our crowns down before the Lord's feet. Sometimes we need to sing a new song, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to come. We're going to sing some songs. He's going to say, go and take dominion and authority over these ten cities or whatever we're called to do. Okay, um, but it's so a worshiping and all that. But there, what we do in heaven will not be, I don't think, burdensome, wearying, like we do in our mortal bodies, right? We'll be replaced by spiritual bodies in heaven. But even at that, we will have these opportunities for reflection, opportunities for just expo- experiencing an opportunity to praise and worship God in the midst of all the busyness of heaven. Not, not playing harps and sleeping on clouds. We'll be doing things in heaven. We won't get exhausted. We won't get tired in our new spiritual bodies. But we should and will, I think, have an opportunity to praise and worship God as a separate component of our life in heaven compared to the busyness that heaven might have for us. You know, we don't talk about heaven all that much, and we can only make big speculations about it. But it seems to me God has purposes and plans for people in heaven. Remember, what, is, what does Jesus say to the woman at the well? Right? God is looking for, uh, for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's like he's, he wants to prove, uh, us to prove to him that we are heaven-worthy, if you will, because of our faith, so that he can use us for something. Not just stand around in a great big auditorium worshiping him all the time. You gotta, okay, everybody good? All right. So, um, and as I said, the promised rest of, for believers is it has no end. So just like day seven, it's figuratively, not literally, has no end. Okay, so it wasn't recorded as an evening and a morning because in the literal heaven, there won't be any ceasing to our eternal existence. Um, and then, so I think finally here, dishonoring the Sabbath by not engaging in regular rest periods, not remembering the God of creation, and the God of our redemption and the promise of eternal life, it, dis, it's a, it dishonors him. We should do something. That might, you know, and again, I'm not trying to be legalistic. It, may, it might be a half hour on a given day that we really think about these kind of components of what a Sabbath day might want to be, or what God might want us to do in a Sabbath day. For others, it might be literally a 24-hour period where we truly mark off time and say, this is really just all about God. It's not about cleaning the house, changing the oil in the car, going to work, cleaning clothes. It's about a relationship time with God. And I think God would honor that if we could carve that out in our schedules. But again, let's not be legalistic. So how can we honor the Sabbath? I'm going to uh, probably finish with this here, but how can we honor the Sabbath? Once again, what, how can we apply this? Because I get, you know, in my, well, I guess it's roughly 30 years now of, of being a Christian and being involved, some people saying the person who has answers on questions, the theological stuff, um, you know, the Sabbath comes up all the time. Are Christians required to honor the Sabbath? Are Christian, what are we supposed to do with the Sabbath? You know, I, you know is there anything with me? I think here's what we can do. Believers, New Testament believers. Okay. I think we should work hard in our vocation, our ministry, the, our education if we're a student, in our family obligations, if you know, we're domestic or all those kind of things, and many more things that we do. We should, we should actually put our full self into them. Be the best of whatever we're called to do in those things. A, you know, working in a, a job, uh, raising kids, homemaker, Bible teacher, whatever it is, we should do it well. I think that's part of what we're called to do. And then I think we should be intentional about taking time to rest and being thankful to our Creator and our Savior. It doesn't have to be a day. It has to be intentional, I think. Clearly, I would never advocate for anybody being legalistic. Christ came to abolish the law to set men free from the bondage of the law. We don't need to put ourselves back under the law and feel some type of burden that is not not from heaven, it's from man. 
So don't put yourself under something that, is, that doesn't come directly from Scripture or directly from heaven and the Spirit. And honor the purpose and intent of the Sabbath regularly, but not religiously. I think we should spend, you know, if, if, if outside of this class, and it may be hard to do in this church because I bring it up a lot, but if outside of this class, if you go, I really don't think about creation all that much. I just, I, I just never even think about it. Right? I never even, never even think about the six days of creation. I never think about how creation and evolution are just at constant odds with one another in terms of philosophical views. I don't want to think about these things. Well, you're probably missing part of the Sabbath that God wanted you to remember. You wouldn't be, we wouldn't be as a people, as a, even Christians, we wouldn't be so susceptible to the lies and scheming of the enemy about the truth of creation if we actually connected to it on a regular basis. And it really is one of the most pernicious lies and attacks of the enemy in the last 200 years. Evolution, it does everything it can, and and those proponents of evolutionary theory are trying to do everything they can to pull as many Bible-believing Christians out of a foundation of faith. Right? And so if we're connected to it, it's hard you know, if we're, if we're thanking God every single, uh, you know, every single week or on a regular basis, thank you, Lord, for creating the light on day one. Thank you for creating the firmament on day two. Thank you for creating the plants and the trees on day three. It's, isn't it much more difficult for those uh, evolutionary and materialistic kind of philosophies to knock us off of our thankful heart for what God did on those creation days? That's, that's what I think is you know, true, the true value of blessing and benefit to actually making sure we don't forget the purpose of the Sabbath, which is, number one, first and foremost, to remember the God of creation. So God promises to honor the Sabbath. Look, he promises to honor the Sabbath, and he promises to give honor to those who honor him because of our obedient hearts when we take an opportunity to carve out a relationship time with him. So be thankful. This is what believers can do. Be thankful that God created us in six days as part of that six-day process. And always be ready for our eternal rest to come. That means not we should be thinking about the two ends of the human timeline. We ought to be spending some time on a regular basis thinking about creation and thinking about eternal life. Thinking about creation, thinking about eternal life. And, we, and then we can fill in the gaps of everything else in between. But I think it's really important to remember the foundation of how everything began and remember where we're going because God in Christ purchased and gave us a gift of salvation that we are all have the hope that we're looking forward to with our eternal life that he's promised to us. Okay. So let's take a break on that, and we will come back and review um, this whole Creation Week stuff and... Uh, Move on from there.